Welcome back to the Arabella Boathouse. This week we'll take some time to address some frequent comments that we've been getting recently, and then Steve will go into detail about some of the electrical and water systems that we haven't addressed yet. And a quick reminder that we're still fundraising for the two paid positions we need filled to make the launch date in June. Becoming a $5 a month member on Patreon is a great way to help out, and a huge thanks to all those that have signed up or increased their pledge in the last couple of weeks. The candidate search is going well, but it's looking like we'll need to find housing for the right folks. So if you own or know of a property with three to four bedrooms within half an hour of Granby, Massachusetts, zip code 01033, available from February till the end of May, please, please be in touch with us. Are those tanks supposed to be there? That's a, a very common question now that we've done the diesel tanks. And the answer is yes. So Atkin has the tanks underneath the cockpit seats in the cockpit. He has the cockpit built a little bit differently there than we ended up doing it. But the tanks are in the same location. And ours are diesel tanks, not gasoline tanks, because this was drawn so long ago that diesels I don't think existed yet or definitely didn't exist for boats. Um, so there'll be diesel instead of gas, but Akin spec'd having 60 gallons of gasoline underneath the cockpit seats. So putting the tanks where we put them is as planned and shouldn't create any issues to the stability or to the balance of the boat. If you look at the sail plan over here, you will see your center of effort for the boat and you'll see your center of the effort for each of the sails. And when Atkin designed this boat, he took all of that into account. So you need to have, you know, you have your center of balance here on the boat and you have your center of effort. And when you reef the sails, that changes it. Uh, if you change the configuration of the boat at all, that can change. So as you build the boat and as you design a boat, maintaining that center of effort and center of balance is pretty important. Now with that said, Atkin designed this boat in the 1930s and there would be a lot of variation. So if you took these plans and gave them to 10 different builders, you would get 10 different weight boats. You've got 9,000 pounds plus or minus and then you have about 3,000 pounds put inside the bilge. And that interior ballast is, as Atkin said, meant to compensate for how you outfit the boat and how you build the boat and how the boat sits. So if you were to end up with a little more weight in the aft section and you put her in the water and you're at the water line in the stern and your stem is sitting high, you would just put more of that 3,000 pounds forward until she sat on her lines. If she sat a little bit to port, you would try to put it on starboard and you would balance out the boat that way. But in reality, you've got over 9,000 pounds on the keel and on a boat that is as big and heavily built as Arabella, if you were to walk from one side of the deck to the other, it shouldn't make a big difference. You're not gonna uh, suddenly dip a shear six inches on one side. And so if you think about it, I mean, the weight of one of those fuel tanks is no different than having two people sitting on one side of the cockpit or two people balanced on either side of the cockpit. And if you, if a couple people's weight is negligible, then that will be negligible. Where it does add up is if you had 20 people sitting along one rail, then obviously that would be an issue. And that's the same as if we put all of the weight on the boat in one side. So by having water tanks low in the boat and balanced between port and starboard and keeping that all in kind of a, a rough mind, it should land us to pretty close to where Atkin drew it for sitting in the water. And we have 3,000 pounds that we can add or subtract to, to make up that difference, which should be, should be plenty of wiggle room. But what about the oak planking? What about it? The oak planking is a lot heavier than the cedar. And of all the changes we've done to Arabella, that's definitely the biggest one. 
Um, the next biggest thing would be the amount of internal fittings and accoutrement that are going into the boat. So if, if you look at Atkins plans, there's, there's not a water heater, there's very little navigation gear, all of that stuff is, is pretty Spartan and all of that does, does add weight. Um, but we've got a couple articles here from Wooden Boat Magazine, which is a great reference. This one actually is the most recent, so it might even still be on newsstands. And there's a great article in here. So when the designer designed the boat, they said it should weigh 7,380 pounds. All of those bronze fitments and church pews add up. Artisan admits he was shocked when a crane operator told him the scale pegged it at 10,000 pounds. So here you have a very small boat that is almost 3,000 pounds heavier than what she was designed for. Artisan will carry full main staysail and jib up to 16 or 18 knots before taking in a first reef. At that point, he also douses the staysail for better balance. So he's saying that she's not an incredibly fast boat, and if you built her as designed, she'd probably be a little quicker. Um, but even at 23 feet and 3,000 pounds overweight, she's completely fine. Um, and he says she's a great stable boat, and that probably is partially due to the fact that she's heavier than designed. So if we were gonna do charters with Arabella and we were gonna take passengers out, or if we were gonna go commercial fishing off her, which would be kind of weird, um, we would be subject to Coast Guard inspections. And if we were gonna carry clients, passengers, we would have to do stability tests and make sure there's emergency exits and possibly put in watertight bulkheads. And there's, there's all sorts of rules depending on what you're doing in the boats and the waters and everything else. But Arabella is gonna be a recreational vessel, so those don't apply. There's things that we have to comply with, with discharging waste and safety gear on board and a few things like that. Um, but we don't need to have Arabella go through any rigorous Coast Guard inspections or anything like that. And if you want to see what the Coast Guard will let you launch and sail, uh, you should check out Raw Faith. And they built and sailed that boat and uh, nobody told them they couldn't. Okay. Props too small, hole in the rudder is too big. Well, not quite. So the hole in the rudder is too big right now. Uh, and Atkin has a pretty substantial cutout in the rudder for the prop. It's designed that way. Uh, and when we lofted the boat way, way back many years ago, uh, we lofted the rudder out. And when we made the rudder, when I made the rudder, we pulled out the lofting floor and pulled the patterns right off of that. Now, I said the prop aperture is a little bit bigger than it's supposed to be at the moment. And part of the reason for that is the prop. So here is our beautiful very prop. And that goes about here. Now, this prop might seem a bit small if you are used to power boats, um, but it is sized appropriately for Arabella. Now, how do we know it's sized appropriately? If you want to crunch the numbers yourself, I highly recommend picking up the Propeller Handbook by Dave Gurr. And this entire book is just about sizing and figuring out propellers. So there are all sorts of just insane graphs and charts and complication for all of this. Um, but in its simplest form, it's a combination of the design of the boat and your motor um, are really two of the big ones. So we could put a huge prop on here, but we would need a huge motor to turn that prop. And since Arabella is a displacement hull, Arabella is never ever gonna go faster than maybe seven or eight knots. It doesn't matter if we put 3000 horsepower in there and a 10 foot diameter propeller she's just gonna create a wave and just slowly sink into the wave. So there's only so much point in putting a motor on the boat and putting a prop on the boat because you're only gonna to get to a certain level of speed and that caps you. Um, so for Arabella, a 50 horsepower motor is plenty powerful. Um, boats this size have 30 horsepower motors in them and they're diesels, so they're slower and they're high torque and they're 
pushing a fairly small prop because we're only gonna try to get the boat up to seven or eight knots, absolute max, probably gonna be motoring at more like three or four or five knots. Um, and that bigger propeller, it just causes more drag and it needs a bigger motor to push it. Um, so it really just depends on the motor size, the boat design, the gear ratio and the transmission. And we gave all of that information to Accutech and they crunched all the numbers and told us that we should have a 16 inch prop. So we are trusting the professionals on that one because it is a, a level of complication outside our wheelhouse. So our prop goes about here. We've got a cut out in the stern for it. And right now we have an oversized cutout in the rudder. And the reason we have an oversized cutout in the rudder, it's somewhat common for you to have a prop on here and for the rudder to come over as far as it can and for the prop not to be able to come out. And it hits the rudder. And the only way to take the prop out is to, and to pull the shaft and all of that is it's a lot more complicated. You can't just <clears throat> uncouple it on the motor and slide the shaft out. So right now I left that rough opening in the rudder a little bit oversized. Once we mount the prop and we get the rudder up here, I can swing the rudder over and see what our clearance is. And I'm going to put in a little filler block, which is going to give us a really nice, pretty shape around the rudder. And if we ever, around the prop, and if we ever want to take that prop off or do anything, we can just take out that little filler block in the rudder, turn the rudder over and be able to slide everything out. Uh, and that's an ease of maintenance thing. Because this rudder is so heavy and there's three pintles and grudgeons that you need to line up for it, uh, I would really love to just leave it on the boat. Um, the rudder can stay for a long time, but switching out the bearing that goes in here, the little rubber cutlass that the shaft rides in, you gotta do that somewhat regularly. Every handful of years, the prop should get maintenance and serviced. Um, so it's gotta come off for those times. So that is why that hole is kind of grotesque right now and, and it will be fixed and it will be pretty and it will be easy to take the prop off in the future. And the rudder is plenty strong, plenty strong. It's not gonna break. We're not doing that much lever on it. And um, I don't know what happened, but I can say that the rudder did get dropped at one point and it was fine. So if it was gonna break, it definitely would have broken then. Which tool? Chainsaw? Sawzall. So, I think people went most bonkers when you poured the lead keel, and then maybe second bonkers is the chainsaw use. People get, people get real riled up about the chainsaw. So here is a chunk of oak that is very dry and quite thick. This looks like, I don't know, five, six by seven, six by six, something like that. Um, very reminiscent of the stern post. And we carved, or I carved, the angles on the stern post with a chainsaw. And there's a lot of people that wanted to know why we didn't do it with a tool with more control. Um, and in my opinion, the chainsaw is the tool with the more control. So one of the ones that people really were curious why we didn't use um, is one of my least favorite tools, the Sawzall. Uh, the Sawzall and the router are two of my least favorite tools. Very useful, very, very useful. Spent a lot of hours behind both of them. I just don't particularly have a fondness for them. Uh, so one of the challenges with the Sawzall is that the blades are pretty floppy. Um, so they can walk and they are more or less a demolition tool. They're not really meant for, for trying to carve big chunks of wood out. So I'm shaking everything right now, trying to do this. Everything is vibrating. And if I want to make this cut come out or go in a little bit, it's, it's not the easiest to do. And 
and that's with a brand new blade in the sawzall. It's, it's a great tool, um, but for making big cuts in hardwood with any accuracy, it, it, it's just not the one I would pick. Now, the, saw, uh, the chainsaw, infinitely more dangerous. Um, I am of the mindset that the chainsaw is probably the most dangerous thing you can buy and operate without a permit in a lot of states. Um, these things send a lot of people to the hospital every year. But it has a rigid blade, so you have more control. This, this blade, the bar, isn't wobbling all over the place. It's got way more power. Um, and this was a, a brand new sharp sawzall blade, and I've been cutting firewood for several days with this chain, and it definitely needs to be sharpened. But you're gonna see, even with a dull chain, it's gonna outperform the sawzall. <laughs> As you can see, I have lots of control with the chainsaw. It removes this material really quickly. And if we put a narrower bar on it, like what you have on a carving chainsaw, we could cut waves in and out of timber and have no problem at all. So I have a lot more control with this angle and this angle with the chainsaw than I do with the sawzall. And now one thing that is really dangerous with the chainsaw, and it's why it has this break on the top, is called kickback. So what this break does is if this saw jumps back and your hand hits it, you hear that click? That's locking the chain. And the reason is that is so if you're cutting and it kicks back and this chain comes up to your face, you are physically not gonna hold this. It's gonna rip out and you're gonna hit it and you're gonna get smucked in the face with a super hot, sharp chain that hopefully is not spinning anymore. That's what the brake is for. And kickback, you know, we're not gonna teach you how to safely use a chainsaw here, but kickback occurs when the tip of the chain is engaged with the wood, or it can occasionally happen if it gets pinched or you hit a foreign object like a nail or a piece of wire can sometimes cause the saw to do that. But the vast majority of time, it's in the tip. Right now at a low RPM, knowing that I'm doing it, that hitting it and running up the wood, I'm ready for it. If you are running this full bore and you bump something with that tip, it can throw all of that power back at you. Um, so that's something that I'm very aware of Wearing a face shield, wearing chaps, doing all that protective gear, awesome, great. There's no such thing with a chainsaw as being too safe. Um, in these instances, I've spent so many hours behind this tool. I know it so well. Um, there are risks that I personally am comfortable taking, um, but this is an incredibly dangerous tool and be very, very, very careful with it if you use it. Um, but in the right hands who understand how it operates and have experience with it, it's amazingly efficient, way more controllable than you would ever think. Uh, and if you have any doubts about that, you should go hang out at a boat yard while they're building center lines or doing any major work. You'll see the chainsaw coming out a lot. And go watch some carving videos and see what the guys and the women are doing, doing chainsaw carving. It's pretty amazing. Um, and they're running some pretty big saws and doing some pretty intricate work with them. And like any tool, it's, it's really just knowing what to expect and how it's gonna behave and what you're looking out for. That goes into the inverter, which then... All right, I've spent a lot of time on this. Here's our systems diagram. So when the systems person comes in, I'm giving them this pile of systems and saying, go to it, get to it. Um, no, in reality, this is just a horrible drawing to try to illustrate something. So we are looking and in, in the process of hiring a couple of folks to help us reach the launch date. And there's been a lot of people who have questioned, why don't we just move the launch date? And what about this? What about that? And there's a few reasons. One is some people have already made plans. Um, and if you're traveling internationally, you got to make those plans in advance. And we knew that. So we want to make sure that we hit that for those people. Um, but even more so than that, 
I really, really want my mom to be at the launch and to be in the best health she can be. And I would be over the moon to be able to take my mom and my two sisters and all four of us go for a sail this summer. And we don't know what the timeline looks like with that with my mom. Um, we just know that it is ticking. So if we can hit launch for June 17th, we can allow everyone to keep their plans and we have the best chance of having mom at the launch and being able to take my mom out sailing this summer. Uh, and that is something that I am willing to basically break myself to accomplish. Um, so hopefully we'll get a few folks in here and some more regular volunteers and I won't have to break myself to make that happen. Um, but that is why we are striving so hard for that goal um, and are really reticent to move it. Um, so with help in mind and systems and all of that, I've been trying to make sure that all of the ducks are in a row so that when we do have people come in, everything is on hand, there's nothing we're waiting for and we can just really get to work. Uh, and we're gonna go through all of the systems in great detail as to why we chose what we chose and how it's going. Um, but I know what's gonna happen is we're gonna grab the batteries and go to install them and folks are gonna go, well, what about, what about, what about, what about? So what we wanna do is just go through real quick here and show you the overall systems for the boat. Um, discounting the nav gear, we've already talked about that in length. You can go check out that video if you're interested in what we're putting in for nav. Uh, this is more the electrical supply to the the nav and a couple other big systems. So if we look at my amazingly skilled drawn diagram here, we've got four little squares and these are representing our batteries. And our batteries are going to have power inputs by a couple places. So we're going to have some solar panels that we're going to mount onto the boat that will be charged by the sun. And that will go through a charge controller and make its way into the batteries. Uh, we also can put on some wind turbines or the hydro generator, which is an air and water version of basically the same principle. Um, that will also go into a charge controller and into the batteries. Now, if we don't have any sun and we don't have any wind, our options for charging the batteries come off of our diesel engine, which is what this square represents, and the alternator. So when we're running the diesel, that will run the alternator, and the alternator will charge the battery for the diesel. We want a lead acid battery that's just for starting the diesel, and that will be charged off the alternator, just like in your car. And that alternator is also capable of charging the house batteries. So if we are running the diesel, we will also be topping up the batteries. Now we're gonna put an inverter into the boat, which is what this blacked out square is and the inverter is a charger and inverter. So we will be able to take power from the batteries in DC, put them into the inverter and have them come out AC, which we need to run the water heater, which I decided to put in, I got convinced. So the 110 water heater will run off the inverter. The other thing the inverter does is it allows us to charge from shore power, such as a house or a dock or generator. So that 110 power would come into the inverter, which would flip it into DC, and it would charge the batteries. Now the water heater we got can be charged, heated up 110 off of the batteries, or it has a heat exchanger coil off of the diesel. So the diesel cools by sucking in raw seawater, running it through the motor, and sending hot water overboard. And this will tap into that system, snag that extra heat, and use it to heat up the water maker. And then our batteries will send the power over to a distribution panel at the nav station, which will then send it out to the remainder of the boat. So in its absolute simplest form, this is pretty much what the systems on Arabella are gonna look like from getting power out in the world into the batteries and from the batteries into the rest of our systems through the boat. I don't have a generator drawn on here. We don't have a gen set and I'm not planning on putting a gas generator on the boat. My hope is with the big battery bank we're putting in, running the diesel from time to time, being able to plug into shore power and having wind, solar and hydro should be able to generate enough electricity uh, that we don't need to have a generator. But if we did have to have a generator, it can go into the inverter and that will safely allow us to charge the batteries. 
When it comes to setting up the electronics and the systems for the boat, there are a bewildering variety of ways that you can do it and options. And this is one of the instances where I'm going kind of with peer review. So I have a friend, Madison, who is currently retrofitting her sailboat from propane and diesel over to completely electric. She's putting an electric drive in, custom making the battery bank. Um, she's doing a, doing a crazy job on all of that. So I reached out to Madison and asked her what her opinions were on what batteries we should use and what charging equipment we should use because she knows me very well, she knows the project very well, uh, and she had been doing an insane amount of research. So Madison wrote me three pages um, with recommendations for power system and water heater. She cited her references, put in links to purchase, so like, Thank you, Madison, this was gold. Um, and then I took all this information that Madison gave me and sent it over to Satchel, who consults on all sorts of stuff for the project and is a naval architect and also knows a lot about all of this. He had just a couple little changes and tweaks. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, if it's good enough for Madison and Satchel, it's good enough for me. Uh, kind of like I feel with the sales, if it's good enough for Robbie Doyle and Harkin, I'm gonna be all right with it. So Madison recommended SOK batteries. Uh, so these are a lithium iron phosphate and each of this is 206 amp hours. So between the four of them, we've got 824 amp hours, which is a pretty big battery bank. Um, but these are, they're quite light. They're actually half the weight of a lead acid battery. Uh, so tucking these in the stern by the diesel, we've got the space for it. The weight's not an issue. And by having a bigger battery bank, we'll be able to go longer durations without charging. So if we're gonna motor from point A to B and be motoring all day, we'll be able to charge up this full battery bank and then be able to take, um, my guess would be a, a week or two to drain the battery bank without any power having to go in. So if we have cloudy days um, or if we're motoring a lot or we have a ton of sun, the big battery bank will, will give us a wider range. Uh, and lithium iron phosphate just kind of seems to be the way to go these days. You can drain them so much lower than lead acid. They charge a lot faster. They have more charge cycles. And the iron phosphates are quite safe. These are all sealed up. They don't off gas. There's nothing to worry about there. Um, and the chances with fire with lithium iron is, is really, really low. They're quite safe. There are some quirks though that come with the lithium. Uh, and a bunch of this Victron equipment is to help with that. So we've got a smart charger here, which isn't gonna be built into the boat. What this is for is for charging and testing and maintaining these batteries. So they all wanna be at the identical voltage and charge state. And sometimes one of them can get a little bit off and things stop functioning. So that's what this charger is about. We'll be able to just charge up one battery. We'll be able to charge them before we put them in the boat. So that's what that is for. And then the rest of this equipment here, um, these three pieces are just to read what's going on in the system. So we have a smart shunt that will go in the line that talks to the servo which talks to our little touch screen. And that'll let us know what's going on with the batteries and with um, power coming off of the diesel from the alternator. And that'll give us a picture of everything that's going on there. We've got a smart battery protect, uh, and that will be part of the kit that goes in to protect these batteries from being drained too far. Now that power is gonna come into and out of this multi-purpose support compact, it's pretty big, uh, inverter. Um, we need this size of an inverter to run our little six gallon water heater here. Uh, and this one also allows us to charge the batteries from shore power or from a generator. So this will take our 12 volt, it'll make it into 110, and it'll also allow us to take 110 and make it into 12 volt. So that's what that rig does. This is our six gallon electric water heater. And this is something I've hemmed and hawed and gone back and forth on with the boat. Um, and 
one of the biggest things that kind of swayed me towards putting it in was talking with Sailing Totem, who's done a whole bunch of cruising. If you're not familiar with them, you should go check them out. They have a lot of really amazing information. But they said being a liveaboard to not make it camping. Make it so that you're comfortable and you're not camping. And Robin and I love to go climbing and mountain biking and we want to go to cold places and going out on land and doing some adventure and getting disgusting and coming back and taking a cockpit shower when it's 30 degrees out sounds pretty horrible. Um, and so I've kept the space for the little water heater in mind. There's a spot right after the galley that I've purposefully left open in case I decided to put in a water heater. Uh, and this is one of the smallest ones they make. They make on-demand water heaters, but they take a lot of power. Uh, and this seemed to be the more efficient way to go. We're not gonna leave the water on all the time. It's not gonna be like turn the tap on and have hot water. The idea behind this is we're gonna plumb it into the boat and if we're running the diesel, the heat exchanger through the diesel will run through this and create hot water for us. So kind of unlimited hot water while the diesel's running, as long as we have it in the tanks. When the diesel's not running, what we would do is turn this on and we'll have to see how long it takes, 20 minutes, half hour, and then you can go take a hot shower or do a big load of dishes or whatever you need the hot water for. So this will be installed, but more than likely will not be on all the time. We'll just flip it on when we need it. This also needs a uh, pressure system for it. So we have a small freshwater pump here. Uh, this will pull the water from the tank and send it into the hot water heater and also send it to the mixer so that when you have the shower, you have the hot water that comes out of your water heater and you have your cold water that comes in and your dial mixes them to a comfortable temperature. Uh, so this pump won't provide pressure water for the whole boat. We're still gonna put foot pumps in for the galley. We're still gonna put foot pumps in for the sink for the head. They're pretty foolproof. Uh, you use a lot less water when you're doing the foot pump than when you just turn the tap on and let it run. But we will run a tap at the galley and we will put a shower head in the a shower head in the head. And that's where this will go so that you can have some hot water or some pressurized water for the shower or for the galley sink. But just when we turn it on. This is something I planned on putting in pretty much from the get go. Uh, and this is a water maker. Kind of like the electronics, there's a bunch of different companies that make water makers and a ton of different varieties. And uh, I asked Satchel if he had a recommendation and he said that he didn't, but that he had a friend who professionally installed and maintained water makers in a boatyard for a number of years and reached out to him. And he recommended Spectra. Um, and Spectra is one of the companies that has a fine reputation and it was recommended by the tech. So I went with it. And the model that he recommended if you're gonna do any extensive cruising was the Ventura 200T, which is what we have here. And the T stands for tropical, which basically means that this is going to be a more forgiving unit if you are going to areas with higher um, salt content in the water and warmer temperatures. So if you're gonna be in higher latitudes and mid latitudes and all over the place, um, having the capability of the tropical model, he said would make it a bit more efficient and give us a bit more water per runtime in those more difficult conditions. Um, so it seemed like a fine recommendation to me. How the water maker works is it's pretty simple. It needs its own through hole, So it should have its own inlet, its own strainer and its own exit and it will go through a primary strainer and through a secondary strainer and it goes into the high pressure pump actually here's even a third strainer it goes into the high pressure pump and it puts the salt water into these two um, metal sleeves here that have membranes in them and it jacks that salt water up to they're all a little bit different, but eight, 900 PSI, somewhere around there. And what happens is at that high pressure, it forces fresh water through the membrane, which then gets sent out and into your water tanks. And it sends the remainder as brine back overboard. And it's through that incredible pressure that it forces that fresh water through. And the membranes are so small that only fresh water gets through. This will filter out most bacteria, viruses, minerals, like it, it really strips the water. 
but it's great because you can make water anywhere and having to go and fill up jerry cans and bring them back to the boat in places where dockside water is not drinkable or accessible uh, will make a really big difference. It's got the regulator here so we can tell how many gallons per hour or liters per hour it's producing, what our pressure system looks like. And this here is just a tiny little accumulator tank um, that goes along with the pump. So you, if you have a well at your house, you have actually probably have an accumulator tank period. I know we have one here for a while. I'm not really sure if uh, you have them, if you've got a like town water. But what happens with the accumulator tank is there's a bladder in here and is pressurized. And when the water goes in, it fills this up. And if you draw off just a little bit of water, that pressure in the system makes it so that the pump doesn't turn on. Basically what this does is it just smooths out the pump. So as you have the pump going and you, know, you got this pump cycle that's going, which makes the water kind of have this pounding and this just takes all of that out and smooths it out. Um, so if you have a house, you've probably got a, a good size accumulator tank somewhere. Um, it does the same thing for your home as it does for the boat. And if you do a full blown fresh water system, pressured freshwater system, you would have to have an accumulator tank for that as well. But since we're just doing the freshwater system for some hot water from here and there time to time, we're not going to put an accumulator tank in for that system. Uh, and this is all going to get mounted in and around the head, and that's all been planned for. Uh, so there should be plenty of room to, to get this installed in there. And that way, with all of this high pressure and fluids and everything, if we were to have some hose give up the ghost and it starts spraying water everywhere, inside the head is going to be a great place to have that happen. <laughs>